Welcome to Forbes Newsroom. Joining me now is Alexandra Levine, a technology reporter here at Forbes. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Of course. So recently, you investigated this really dark underbelly of TikTok. Can you explain? Absolutely. So what I'd been hearing uh, and seeing on TikTok is that there were small accounts that normally wouldn't attract many, you know, much attention because they're unverified, they don't have the blue check mark, um, and they just seem to have only a handful of followers. But I've been hearing that some of these seemingly innocuous accounts could actually be portals to illegal child sexual abuse material. There are a number of really large creators on the TikTok platform who have built their following around calling attention to safety issues on the platform and who have specifically been talking about safety issues as they pertain to kids. And several of these creators over the past roughly six months had been raising awareness of this specific issue, the phenomenon they were calling it colloquially, like informally, they were calling it posting in private, or they were calling it posting in, own, in quote, only me mode. And what this essentially means is that uh, they were alleging that there were people who were sharing login information for these very small private accounts, and that they were posting using a setting that would make the videos visible only to the person who's logged in. So if you're sitting on TikTok and looking at some of these accounts from the outside, you don't see a thing. But if you were to be given the login information and log in, you would actually be able to see things that are only visible from, um, you know, being actually inside the account. So we had been hearing a lot about this phenomenon um, and we decided to investigate it. And unfortunately, we're able to confirm that this this is actually happening uh, and it appears to be happening at scale on the platform. So how can you speak to that? How prevalent is this on TikTok? Well, it's very difficult to quantify exactly how many of these accounts there are, because what happens typically is that when accounts or videos from some of these accounts are reported, uh, the content may be taken down or the account may be wiped from the platform altogether or banned. Um, but there's new accounts that are popping up almost as frequently, it seems, as the old accounts are being banned. And so when you're talking about numbers, it is really difficult to quantify, you know, the exact volume. But what I can say is that there are, you know, seemingly endless accounts that have names similar to the accounts that we that we identified as like fully, you know, being problematic and fully violating the community guidelines on TikTok. So um, that's, in, in other words, there are many accounts that all have sort of similar names. A lot of it kind of looks like jargon or like kind of jumbled terms. But what a lot of the, you know, usernames have in common is that they have combinations of the words post and the words private or the word private and then the word video. Um, and so so like I said, even though it's 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 not easy to to put a number on exactly how many of these accounts exist, we have reason to believe that they are, you know, that they are very common on the platform. And just in the course of reporting the story for a couple of months, they were extremely easy to find. Speak to that. I want to talk about how users find and get into these accounts. How easy is it to find the accounts and how do people find them? It's unfortunately really easy to find these accounts on TikTok. Um, some of the accounts, it's easy to find them simply by searching combinations of the words post and private in the search bar. If you search quote, post in private just on its own, it's blocked. But any kind of variation of those words, we call it algo speak. Algo speak is, is basically where users use slang or they'll use deliberate typos to kind of evade, uh, to, to sort of like evade detection by the moderation systems in place. Um, and sometimes just typing in a variation, like a misspelled version of the word post in private will pull up plenty of these posts that are effectively advertising this is how you can come in. You're expected to post if you come in. DM me for the password. Um, those are very easy to find, along with the actual the actual accounts themselves. So what you described also sounds like a bit like whack a mole. You know, one account gets po or gets taken down, another one crops up in its place. So let's take a step back here. What are TikTok's security policies in place that they can't seem to crack down on this? TikTok says it has a zero tolerance policy for child sexual abuse material and that when they find accounts that are attempting to obtain or distribute or otherwise share or consume 
child sexual abuse material that they they ban them immediately they prevent people from creating more than one of these accounts on you know the same device etc um that said this entire story really highlights just how difficult it has been for TikTok to enforce those policies across the board, and also how difficult it is for both AI moderation, um, you know, the content moderation apparatus that's that's fueled by machine learning, and also for human moderators to, to crack down on these things because as I had mentioned, the accounts are evolving and sort of being, being you know, new ones are emerging as quickly as old ones are being banned. And the other piece of this is that the language around the algo speak around this sort of phenomenon, it keeps evolving, it keeps sort of mutating. And um, as soon as they're able to ban one word that is, you know, that might pull up these accounts, another one, you know, another one, users, users start, you know, using another one. So, um, so TikTok absolutely does have policies that are aimed at deterring this sort of behavior. And they have certainly taken steps to crack down on this issue, as evidenced by the fact that if you search the term posting in private in the search bar, you'll get either a warning or you'll get some sort of a label saying, you know, you're attempting to to view material that is not allowed on the platform. Um, but beyond that, it, it really, as you said, is a, is a, is a game of whack-a-mole. Yeah, and I think something interesting that you said is that, you know, people can't see this if you're just looking at the account. You need to get the login information and get into the account to see this type of material. So what are TikTok's rules specifically about sharing login credentials? TikTok flatly prohibits sharing of login credentials. It's stated on their website, it's stated pretty in, you know, in pretty black and white terms that you're not allowed to share login credentials to other accounts, especially if that enables users to participate in activity that violates TikTok's broader community guidelines. That said, in the course of reporting the story, TikTok did give us a few examples of, you know, situations where sharing of login credentials may occur um, and is okay. One of them they said are social media managers or publicists who help creators with very large followings manage their account. They may share their login credentials, but we know that that's actually that's not you know the reason that login credentials are being shared um, for the purposes of of like what we describe in the story. Even more interesting was that two factor authentication, which sounds like a jargony thing, but it's pretty widely known. Two factor authentication is the extra security step that most platforms use now. It's really an industry standard that makes it uh, make make makes you. Uh, you know, verify when you log into an account, either through email or through a phone call or through a text message that you are the person actually who owns the account. Two-step verification, like I said, is an industry standard for so many of the major social media platforms, but it is not turned on as a default on TikTok. And that was something that experts that I spoke to for the story expressed a lot of alarm about. Um, Two-factor authentication is something that would help TikTok in theory uh, detect you know, unusual logins, whether an unusual login means a login from the other side of the world, or perhaps it just means there's 40 people logging into an account at once. Um, but TikTok does not have two-factor authentication turned on as a default. Do you think TikTok would ever consider that because of this problem? Perhaps, um, you know, it's not on me to say whether they should or they should not, but um, experts that we spoke to said that having two-factor authentication on, even just sort of that soft barrier to prevent, you know, people from taking that extra step of being able to actually log into these accounts where they've been, you know, these accounts that they've been sent the, the login information to, um, the experts that we spoke to said that that would go a really long way in cracking down on this kind of problem. And I want to take even a step back here from TikTok. TikTok is not the first social media platform. I'm sure it won't be the last. So ha what, what have other platforms done when it, they've encountered these types of problems? And to what scale have they encountered them? Well, this, this problem is not unique to TikTok alone necessarily. So there have been you know, other reports of, for example, on Facebook or on Instagram of, of other kind of closed group environments that have also been breeding grounds for violative activity. Um, you know, there was a big report in Wired some time ago about Facebook groups, for example, being used as sort of a tool for, uh, for child predators. And so um, we know that the problem is not unique to TikTok alone. Uh, we know that the other 
platforms similar to TikTok have these zero tolerance policies for illegal child sexual abuse material. But we also know that these other platforms, first of all, are not drawing the same volume of young users that TikTok today is drawing. You know, there's some some statistic like um, like more than half of minors in, in the US at this point are logging into, are using TikTok at least once a day. Um, they, all of the other social platforms that have had you know their own iterations of these problems in closed these closed environments. They are they have ceded ground basically to TikTok um, when it comes to younger users. So uh, we know that uh, the other the other big thing is that many of those other platforms also do have two factor authentication turned on. And so I think that you know it comes back to the question of why is TikTok not TikTok not doing that as a default? And if they're not doing it now, will they? You know, in response to to our reporting highlighting these sorts of issues. Yeah, and you mentioned two-factor authentication. Are there any other safeguards that uh, other platforms are putting on aside from that? Because the zero tolerance policies that you're saying all these platforms have kind of sound like empty rhetoric when it's pretty easy to uh, to go on TikTok and search the jargon in the search bar and find these types of accounts. You know, all of these platforms have different ways of doing it. So it's it's sort of it's it's difficult to say, like as a blanket statement, this is the thing that all the other platforms are doing that TikTok is not, you know, beyond two factor authentication, as we've said. Um, but it is interesting to note that all I think most most of the major platforms that are very popular with children have content moderation of both public accounts and private accounts. TikTok also moderates both public and private accounts. And I think that um, one thing that I asked that I didn't get a direct answer from them on is how do you allocate resources between the public accounts with very big followings, the private accounts with smaller ones, and how do you sort of triage, you know, how much attention should be paid or how, how much resources should be placed on on, on monitoring just these smaller accounts. Um, and I didn't really get a clear answer on that. So it would be actually interesting to ask all of the other platforms that are really popular with kids and that also have these closed group environments, you know, how they allocate resources differently between, you know, the bigger, the bigger verified uh, accounts that typically draw more scrutiny versus the smaller ones, which can very easily go overlooked. In your reporting, you've described really graphic child sexual abuse material that has been spreading on TikTok. And will the platform be held to account for this spreading on TikTok? Well, what the platforms have to do, um, and, and they're all in compliance with this, uh, you know, to my knowledge, is they have to report any suspected or known pieces of child sexual abuse material, um, which is the, you know, the term that that children's safety experts are, are using for child pornography, um, that that child sexual abuse material has to be reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is referred to often as NCMEC. Um, all of the social media platforms basically have a direct line into NCMEC, and then NCMEC takes those reports of known or suspected child sexual abuse material, and they're able to be sort of the clearinghouse that then gets that information over to law enforcement. And then law enforcement uh, can then, you know, go pursue, you know, try, try to help victims or try to, you know, track down perpetrators. Um, I think that all of the platforms, you know, have this direct line in, but then there's a question of once law enforcement gets a hold of that information, how much are they really able to do, especially when some of these platforms have millions and millions of pieces of child sexual abuse material that they're reporting into NCMEC. Um, TikTok is one of the platforms that, uh, you know, reports annually or at least to this point, they have been reporting annually to, to Nick Mick. Yeah, and um, you did report that the sharing of these images has gotten the attention of state and federal authorities. Can you speak more to that? Absolutely. So one of the creators who we interviewed for the story, her name is Sierra Adair. She is a child, child sexual abuse survivor herself. And she is one of the creators that I mentioned is using her very large following on TikTok to raise awareness about child safety issues happening on TikTok. She, um, she sent a tip to the Department of Homeland Security earlier this year when she first discovered this issue. She first discovered the issue because somebody who was logged into one of these private accounts actually 
unprivated a video that had been posted of a minor and tagged her in it so that she could see and try to, you know, it's, it seems like they tagged her in it so that she could help expose the problem. Mm -hmm. um, she then started, she, she flagged it through, you know, TikTok's reporting mechanism. It came back that it was no violation. And then she began raising awareness on TikTok herself of, of, of these issues. Um, she tipped off the Department of Homeland Security, which actually responded to her tip. And they reached out seeking more information about the problem, more information about the minors involved uh, and people who had reached out to her who, who were potential victims. And um, they wrote to her in an email earlier this year that they were, quote, working on it. Um, they didn't respond to a Forbes uh, request for comment about whether a formal investigation of TikTok is underway. Uh, but then in addition to that, there is a... Um, one of the videos that this creator made explaining this issue went so viral that it actually landed in the feed of somebody who is an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas. So once the sibling communicated it to the, the prosecutor, the prosecutor actually reached out to the creator, Sierra Adair, and, and, and effectively has, has been in touch with Sierra for, for more information and to, to help sort of like pursue the matter further. Um, the prosecutor also would not speak to Forbes for the story, but we do know that there is broad interest both at the state and the federal level for cracking down on these sorts of issues more. And TikTok generally, even beyond this problem, you know, of the posting and private phenomenon itself, TikTok is, is becoming sort of a bipartisan target in, in Washington. Um, and there's a lot of interest, not only in, in, you know, addressing the issues with TikTok because of concerns over its ties to China, but it's also, you know, the concerns that are related to, to minors specifically. Sure, at least law enforcement is aware of this at both the state and federal level. So because of that, what do you think the chances are that the posters on these accounts will be held to account? Well, it's a that's a really good question. And it's a huge challenge because there are, you know, these these problems, problems like the ones outlined in our story or far worse are unfolding on these mainstream social media platforms like TikTok every single day. And law enforcement only has so many resources. Like when I speak to people who are current and former law enforcement officials um, who have worked on internet crimes, um, the big, the biggest thing that they keep coming back to is we only have so many resources and the problems are developing so quickly that in the amount of time it could take, you know, a law enforcement official to track down, you know, one instance of one post that, you know, that count that you know qualifies as a crime against a child um there are the number of of you know new cases that have emerged in that period of time are like potentially just so many and so um it all goes back to resources um and i think that because there is such a big question of resources uh there's just a lot of you know pressure on the tech companies like tiktok to be self-regulating and to be doing more and to be more aggressively enforcing the policies that they say exist um, and I think that probably in the next Congress, we'll see, um, or, or, sorry, when we get into the new year, we'll, we'll, we'll see probably a lot of the legislation that has already been introduced, um, in all likelihood target the social media platforms that are popular with children more aggressively. What do you think is next in terms of cracking down on this type of content? Um, I think that the, you know, I think that the big thing is um, there's really an issue with, uh, there's really an issue with age authentication that is an industry-wide problem. So age authentication is basically how does a platform know if I say that I'm 18 years old, that I'm actually 18 years old. Um, that is a problem that, you know, across every single social media platform, they really have not come up with a good solve for knowing that. And what happens as a result of them not having a good technical solve for knowing, are you actually as old as you say you are, is that you've got a lot of people on these platforms that don't allow, you know, nine-year-olds on them to actually be on the platforms regardless. Um, so I think that the, you know, there's, there's been, there's long been this race to sort of like crack that code and to figure out, you know, how do we have stronger age authentication protocols? Um, but this is sort of like this industry-wide thing that every time you watch a tech hearing with, you know, the CEOs or executives from a company, this is the one issue that I would say keeps coming up over and over again. Well, Alexandra, thank you so much for your reporting. Thank you so much for having me.